I was meditating really early this morning. I, I have to, I, I'm really kind of angry that I, I woke up at 2 a.m. <laughs> and uh, I, I tried my best to get back to sleep, but didn't. And uh, I got up and read most of the uh, book of Acts this morning. And, uh, you know, I just was thinking how awesome it is that this, this message that we carry is universal. You can't go any place on the planet that is not needed, that is not critical, and it really is the most important thing they'll hear. And uh, so as we uh, look at missions teams going out, I just want everybody to be prepared. In fact, I'm going to ask for prayer. In weeks to come, I'll be uh, in Zimbabwe again and uh, be speaking to a, a very large conference there, thousands of pastors and, and leaders from around Africa and maybe other places around the world. I'm not sure what their, their group is going to be totally. Uh, but we're going to be talking about things that we've been talking about here. Basically, that, that whole conference is going to be about abiding in the Spirit. And I don't know of anything more important than that because, the, this, you know, I was reading this morning and one, one of the sermons that Peter preached, he called the Lord the author of life. Think about that, the author of life itself. And he still is. And we, we, want to, we want to be part of that exchange of heaven and earth because so much of what we do is, is pretty much earthbound. And, and God has an answer for the issues of the earth and it is his spirit. Everything that's coming from God is coming through his spirit. And once we understand that, we're not afraid of the spirit of God anymore. I grew up in a, in a denomination that uh, basically if, if anybody ever got touched by the Lord and did anything spiritual or biblical, it would scare the bejeebers out of people. <laughs> How sad is that? The Lord is speaking via His Spirit to people all over the planet today, and we just want to be part of that, don't we? And today I'm going to talk about the arrival of the Comforter. Uh, you know, I, I, in my reading lately, I can't hardly get out of, of John 21, uh, John 14. In that, in that area of time, Jesus was becoming more and more intense talking to His, his followers about what was coming. It wasn't what they wanted to hear. Because he was going away and he said he was going to send another comforter. And that message fell on deaf ears because it was out of the context of what they understood. All they knew was God in the flesh here. Uh, they didn't really totally even understand that, but they knew that what he had is what they wanted. They felt something when, when they were with him. They saw something when they were with him. It wasn't just a theory that was talked about in, in glowing terms. It was real. People that, that, were, that were bound were set free. Demons came out of them. They, they saw uh, the withered hands heal up instantly. They saw people come back from the dead. I'm telling you, that's what they were walking with. And they couldn't possibly imagine him not being there anymore. But Jesus sat with them one day and said, listen, guys, it's to your advantage that I go. Because if I go, I'm going to send another comforter. Now, oh, that's great, but it's not you. But I think we're going to find out as we go through here today that it really is him in essence. What made him who he was was the same spirit that was going to make them what they never could be. We don't need to be afraid of the Holy Spirit of God. He's not an afterthought. He's not something added on for interest and excitement. He was right there in the morning of creation. When God the Father had ordained that he would create a world, he first of all dispatched the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit brooded over the void, the nothingness. He was active. He was energetic. The word in the Hebrew is very interesting how he brooded there. He, he was there over the emptiness, and then the word came. And John chapter 1 tells us that it, the word was with God. The word was God. Nothing was created that was not created by him. He's the creator of life. So when we talk today from the word of God, we're talking from God's heart to ours. We're experiencing something that cannot be experienced unless 
the Holy Spirit does what he does. Can I just tell you, God is ready to do something on planet earth again. That's going to dwarf everything he's done before. These are crazy times we're in. But the darkness, the craziness has been prophesied. It's nothing that we can't, that we haven't expected at some level. But I'll tell you this, God has a plan for these times. And when it gets dark, the light looks better. So we need to understand that and we need to embrace it, just like we sang this morning. But Jesus had intensified his conversations with the disciples before his crucifixion and after his resurrection. He increasingly focuses on the coming of the comforter, as he called him, and the significant advantages of his presence in their lives going forward. Jesus commends the disciples to the Holy Spirit who will equip and lead believers as he ascends to heaven. The comforter or the helper, depending on your, your version, was a commonly used term in those days that described the, the, the services of an attorney or a counselor or an advocate who comes alongside someone and support and assistance. John 14, 16 joins those two phrases together. This is beautiful. He called it another helper. This provides very useful description that I, I love, and I would, I would encourage you, if you can, to get a hold of this scripture, uh, this, uh, this statement, because this is what the original words mean and when joined together. Talking about the comforter, he communicates this thought. One besides me, and in addition to me, but one just like me. He will do in my absence what I would do if I were physically present with you. So when the Holy Spirit manifests himself, in, in a very real sense, it says Jesus, we're here, physically. Since we're visual, since we're touch, taste, smell, so forth, our senses, our five senses, we, we understand our world through those senses. It's hard for us to, to grasp spirit. But spirit is the core. The part of you that lives forever is, a, is your spirit. The spirit from God is universal. The Holy Spirit and your spirit co-join in salvation. He comes and indwells us by his spirit. So when we understand that this is not just a feeling, it's not just code for excitement, it's the very presence of God himself. Why wouldn't we not want to embrace him with our whole mind, body, soul, and spirit and grasp everything he's doing, everything he's saying. We want every gift he has given. The Bible says, do not come behind in any gift waiting on the coming of the Lord. And I know why. It's changed my life. Not near as much as I want him to yet, but I'll tell you, he's not done John 14, 16, man, what a beautiful revelation that is. He assured the disciples of the continued leadership and continuity of all Jesus did and taught. He was, in fact, inviting them into the nature and the capacities of the Holy Spirit that they did not yet understand. In John 14, he looked at them and said, listen, he who has been with you, shall be in you. Big game changer. Game changer. Topical religion does nothing for you. Liturgies, statements, religious jewelry, all that stuff is topical. All that stuff is outward. All that stuff is in the realm of the flesh and cannot distribute the things God is wanting to distribute. But when we begin to traffic in the Spirit of God, we get the real deal. 
And it's best when we don't add flesh to it if we can help it. When that happens, you got to have some discernment to know what's of God and what's just plain goofy. And it can get there. John 21 illustrates how the Holy Spirit will change us and subsequently lead us toward maturity. In these verses, Jesus identifies the main characteristic of immature spirituality and then speaks to Peter about the process of maturity that will equip him for the leadership role he's about to assume. And I want to spend a few minutes there with that if I can this morning. And I guess I can since I have the mic, so I'll just do that. Um, you know, that, that last day, this, this had been a rough time for Peter because he'd done this, you know, he was bragging about, you know, listen, if everybody else forsakes you, I'll never forsake you. And then he did the, the trip with the three, you know, disavowals of the Lord, which is a big, big deal in that culture. But now... On the morning that he went out fishing with the disciples, they come in having caught nothing all night long, and Jesus is on the shore. And they have breakfast with him, and, you know, Peter's probably hoping he doesn't bring that whole deal up. And the Lord asked him three times if he loves him, and we went through that before, and I won't, I won't take that time to do that again. But in the bottom line, the Lord commissions Peter to feed his sheep. And then he says this. Verse 18, most assuredly I say to you, when you were younger, you girded yourself and you walked where you wished. But when you were old, you will stretch out your hands and another will gird you and carry you where you do not wish. This he spoke, signifying by what death he would glorify God. And when he had said this to him, he spoke to him again and said, follow me. In a very real sense, this was a prophecy that described Peter's death because he would at some point be stretched out on a cross outside of Rome and crucified and martyred. Tradition tells us, we don't know for sure if it happened exactly like this, but I can, I can picture it. Peter was pretty brash. Apparently, he demanded of his executioner that he would not die upright like the Lord had, but that he would be turned upside down on this cross, and he expired there outside of Rome and perhaps that position. But while that's true, and while that was a submission to something he wouldn't have chosen, that's the way he lived. Wasn't too many months after that time when Peter, who was a devout Jew and amongst all the other Jews, believed that the salvation that had come to them through Christ was only for the Jews. And one day Peter was on a rooftop and he became hungry and he, while they were preparing the food for him to eat, he fell into a trance, the Bible says. In other words, he had a vision. And in the vision, there was a sheet that came down from heaven, held at four corners, and on it were all kinds of, of animals, and it represented food that the, the people who were not Jewish would eat because it was unclean food. And the word came to him while he saw that vision, Peter, arise, kill, and eat. And being a preacher, he was very religious, so he said, I have never eaten anything unclean in my life. I don't know any preachers that don't have junk food in their life, but nevertheless, he was saying, basically, I'm too spiritual to do something like that. It happened three times. And then the word of the Lord came to him, that which I have called clean, do not you call unclean. And immediately... The Spirit of God said, there are three men down at the gate, and they're asking you to come with them. Go, doubting nothing. What he did not know was that these were Gentile men, and they had come from a fellow's house named Cornelius, who was a Gentile man. And this man was righteous. He was, he was seeking God, and, and he had a vision 
of a, of a man in bright raiment come and stand before him and tell him exactly who to call. And, and he was, because he was praying, and, and God said, you call Peter. His name is Peter. He's staying in a, at the house of Simon the Tanner, and he told him exactly where. And these guys took off under, under direction from Cornelius and came and tried to find Peter and found him after he had just had this vision. There's a lot of stories here I'd love to tell, but the divine guidance of God is the most exciting thing on the planet for a believer. I mean, when you, when you know for sure that you're on the trail, that the breadcrumbs the Lord is laying out are his, there's nothing in the world like it. You're sitting here today because of one of those stories in my life. And I'm so excited to tell you there's been many more and I'm looking for more yet. It's so fun. It's so exciting. You walk in faith when you know God said. That's the way it starts. And Peter, he didn't want to go. He knew, first of all, that all his brothers were going to think he'd fallen off the wagon and that he'd gone crazy because they believed it was only for the Jews. And yet, you can't deny this vision and now this confirmation of. It's got to be God. And see, he goes with these guys, and when he gets to Cornelius' house, he finds not just Cornelius, he finds a whole group of people there. And he's starting to preach, you know. Preachers preach. And God cut him off and baptized all those people with the Holy Spirit. And while he's talking to them, these Gentiles that are not supposed to get to do this stuff, they're all starting to speak in tongues. The Spirit of God has fallen on this place, and it's obvious. And, and he, he looks around, well, and, and the people that were with him, he says, guys, this isn't supposed to be. But it did happen, and they're speaking in tongues. It's the same thing that happened to us in the beginning. Who can withhold water from them that they be baptized? So what an what a amazing story. And then he comes back to Jerusalem and everybody's going, what the heck are you doing down there? Or maybe it was saltier than that. I don't know. But the bottom line of it is they were not happy campers to know that Peter, the head of the church, had gone down there and become unclean by ministering to these people. In fact, the interesting thing about this whole move of God back in the day is it happened in public places, not in the church house. Oh, we didn't ha- they didn't have worship teams. They didn't have offerings very often. They didn't have paid clergy for a long time. They just had people full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom. And God was changing the world. Well, I'm getting ahead of myself. You know, it's so so exciting. (laughs) I'm tempted to go stories on you here, but I'm not going to do it. Acts chapter 1. If you've got your Bibles, turn it, open it up, whatever version of Bible you have. I'm just glad you got one. Listen to this. This is the last conversation Jesus had with the disciples before his ascension. Chapter 1, verses 4, 5, and 8. He says, being assembled together with them, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father. He said, you've heard from me that. Verse 5. For John truly baptized in water... But you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. They got busy asking theological questions. Oh, well, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel and so forth and so on? They, they, had, they were political, you know, like a lot of us. And they said, no, it's not for you to know these things. And he goes right on with his story. He says, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and Judea, and Samaria, and to the end of the earth. He's messing with their theology. 
They're, they're all good with that Jerusalem and Judea deal, but that Samaria bunch, let alone the, you know, the end of the earth, that's heathen territory out there. But God's bigger than they thought. I, I suggest he's probably bigger than we think. You know, he, he's, he's, he's got a big vision for God so loved the world that he gave his son that whosoever believes, that is a pretty good sized group, the whosoever world, if they believe, they're my kids. So while I think probably we could take a bunch of different things from this text that would really help us and really prepare us for where God wants to lead us. But I just want you to know God has a big tent. And he'll bring anybody into it that meets that qualification of believing him. And it's pretty exciting stuff. And, and they're ready to believe, as we're going to find out here just in a second. Chapter 2, chapter two you can't have a spirit-filled message if you're not going to talk about the spirit filling. So here we go. He said to them to wait. Ten days went by, and they're waiting, 120 strong in the upper room. When the day of Pentecost had fully come, right on time, it was the day of Pentecost, the, the first fruits in gathering of the wheat fields and so forth, people were there from all nations. In fact, the, the listing of the people that we'll see here in the next few verses actually represented virtually the whole of the, of the extent of the Roman Empire in those days. People that were not necessarily Jewish or were proselytes or whatever had all come to Jerusalem. So there were thousands and thousands of people there uh, for that particular feast. When the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. That's probably the last time that that happened, that people were all in one accord. But that's a good place to be. Which, by the way, I think the Lord, by His Spirit, is working that in many ways today. He's breaking down walls. And, and even between people, God wants us to be in one accord because unity draws the move of God. And we want to be in that, in that situation. But when the Lord, they had them all in one place, verse 2, and suddenly there came a sound from heaven as a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. In my mind, the vision I have for this, because God fills the Old Testament with types and shadows, which are pictures of things that are going to come to fulfillment in the New Testament. And what we see here is, is, a, is a breathing into this group of people. The wind and, and, and spirit in, in the biblical languages normally are the same word. And so what I see in this is a, a, a parallel to what happened in creation when God created the, all the created things and then he created man in his own image as a special class. And then he did something he did not do with any of the rest of them. He breathed into them. And they became a living soul. And in my belief system, I believe that is precisely what happened that day. He breathed life into the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. And all the life that he breathed into them is still available today for those of us who are joining it later on. And those that will join from henceforth. The Spirit of God is the sign of being born again. He, they breathe into them, I believe. Man. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave utterance. And there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under the heaven. And when the sound came to, occurred, they, they came together and they were confused because everyone heard them speak in his own language. It gives the names of, I think there were 12 different uh, peop, uh, groups of people, uh, you know, from around the, around the whole empire that heard the message and, and the mighty works of God being spoken in their language so that they could understand what these people were all about. And to me, that is, is so exciting because God, and, and it, it's almost the counterpart of what happened at, at the Tower of Babel. I've heard people say, well, God can't just give people languages. Well, why not? 
Did, did he read that in the, in the book somewhere that he can't do that? He did it in history. The people had come together and they were unified and they were building a tower unto heaven so that they could make, make a great name for themselves. And God came down and looked at it and said, this is not good. Whatever they, they start to do, they're going to be able to do because they're unified. And he touched them. And suddenly, they were speaking a different language than they'd spoken five minutes before. And he, he separated the people through a gift of tongues, if you will. Well, now he's reversing that process, and he's drawing all mankind together under one spirit and communicating it to different languages to draw them in. But that's not all this is for. Some people say, well, that was just for that one time. Chapter and verse, please. I've actually heard people praying in languages that they did not know that I knew enough of to know what they were praying. But that's not the purpose of this gift. This gift has multiple purposes. Last Wednesday night, I actually spent the evening, most of that evening, talking about 10 things that happen when we pray in tongues that are right from the Scriptures. And those are 10 things that draw you closer to God and bring the Spirit of God into focus and you do not want to be without those things. And so I'm telling you, if you're afraid of that, I understand that. I came from a church that, you know, they heard the Great Commission. And I said, we well, got it. We'll take it from here. But they rejected that wait part, that wait until part. And so they did a pretty good job with what they had. But I'll tell you what, God has more for us than just some doctrine. Can somebody say amen? amen? You're getting quiet on me out there. You know, the, the reactions that people had were, were many. And I, I was going to go through those, but we're running out of time. Um, but what happened next was so amazing because this man, Peter, who was so afraid to confess Jesus that he denied him three times just a few days ago, less than two months ago. Now, here's people saying stuff that get him fired up. These people are drunk that are talking like this. Because it was so loud that they were, they were out in the streets now, and people were asking questions and saying this and saying that. And they were saying, well, these people are drunk. Peter stands up under the unction of the Holy Spirit, and what he has just received has a message for them. And he preaches a sermon that is way beyond his pay grade. And when he gets down to the point of the, of the message that the Jesus is the Christ of God, and he looks at those people and says, whom you crucified. And the Lord has made him both Lord and Christ. And the Spirit of God goes beyond Peter and touches lives out in that crowd 3,000 strong. Some people cried out, man, and brethren, what must we do? Some of them weeks ago had said, crucify him, crucify him. His blood be upon us and upon our children. Well, not what they thought, but now his blood is upon them because they received him. And his blood has cleansed them from their sins. He says, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. Hallelujah. I wonder if at that moment Peter wondered, I remember that word Jesus gave me when I met him that day on my boat when he said, I'll make you fishers of men. And he was drawing in the net and there were 3,000 souls in it. And he was getting ready over the next weeks to see thousands and thousands and thousands more. And within a matter of, of days, my friends, there were more spirit-filled believers hanging around Jerusalem than there were priests in the Jewish faith. And every one of those 6,000 and 7,000 and 8,000 that came in 
we're priests and kings. We don't realize who we are. That we've been given a mantle in, as priests and kings in the kingdom. It's incredible. You carry, you carry the ability to give somebody the way to eternal life. Amazing. I'm going to rebuke that clock if it keeps going. <laughs> And, and let, me, let me just say this. As we go on here, we see some things happen after, after that amazing sermon of, of, of Peter's. And then we see what God did. And, and this is so important. There's a, there's a rule in biblical interpretation called the law of first mention. Anytime you see something significant for the first time in Scripture, there is, is spiritual DNA in it. That, that is the foundation stone of everything that's going to be built upon it hereafter. And what we see is that without any big planning, the church begins to be the church. I mean, it wasn't like five or six people hanging around making plans. This was thousands of people suddenly. And these guys are fishermen and tax collectors and so forth that are running the show. They're not educated men. But the Spirit of God has done something in them that is starting to unify them into something beyond a, a bunch of people kind of hanging out and enjoying each other. This is the church of the living God. And there's four pillars that we see established, and we try and follow these here. In verse 41, then those who gladly received his word were baptized, and that day about 3,000 souls were added to them, and they continued, and they continued steadfastly, which means a, a, a single-minded fidelity to a certain course of action. This, they were single focus. They had a single eye. This, this is what we do. And they began to be the church. They continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. That means they were taught and discipled. And fellowship, which means a shared uh, community kind of thing. And in the breaking of bread, which is when you get down to knowing each other. And then in prayer. Four things. Four things that the Spirit of God deposited in their heart in the very beginning. And these four things are the are the crux of discipleship. So God wasn't just interested in giving some people an experience. I thought I could say, well, I was there when. No, he wants them to have something that they can say, I'm there now. This is where I, this is my people. This is what I do. This is how I grow. This is how I fellowship. This is how I, I, I find out that it's not just me and Jesus got a good thing going. This is a kingdom. This is, a, is a, a group of people that all have something to share. It wasn't very long before they were selling things and, and sharing as people had need. It was a decision, not a, not a commission, but that's what they did. That's how open they were. That's how love was getting a hold of them. And, and this is all, it's the hallmark of a move of God is that people get more generous. They open their wallets and moth flies out, you know, because they, they're starting to give. They're starting to do. They're starting to be part of something bigger than themselves. It's not all about what you can get out of life. It's what you can give. Amen. And it's amazing what God does in a heart. You didn't even know it was in there. You didn't know you had that capability, but it's there because God's there now. But then there's something I want to, I want to give you today because the message that, that Jesus gave Peter about stretching out your hands and another, another, another. Remember that phrase that Jesus gave? Another. Another one just like myself will lead you. You'll say no to your own desires and doing your own thing, and another will lead you. That is the goal of discipleship and maturity. Now, you have an enemy in that. James chapter 3, there's an there's a incredible story here that, uh, that is spoken by James, and James is an amazing guy. He was Jesus' half-brother. 
James the Righteous, they called him. He was the pastor of the church at Jerusalem that eventually was killed by the leadership there, but a godly man. And he, he's talking about something that each of us understand. James chapter 3, verses 2 through 6. And um, it says this, For we all stumble in many things. If anyone does not stumble in word, he is a perfect man, able also to bridle the whole body. Indeed, we put bits in horses' mouths that they may obey us, and we turn their whole body. And he says, look at the ships. Although they are so large and driven by fierce winds, they are turned by a very small rudder wherever the, the pilot desires. And then he says, even so, the tongue is a little member that boasts great things. See how great a forest a little fire kindles? And the tongue is a fire. It's a world of iniquity. The tongue is set among our members so that it defiles the whole body and sets on fire the course of nature, and it is set on fire by hell. They plainly say that if you could tame your tongue, you'd be a perfect man. But no one can. I know someone who can the Holy Spirit. He did it on the day of Pentecost. He proved it. And may I say to you that this, this is an amazing thing. Think about this. If God can sanctify our tongue so that we function as a voice of the Holy Spirit, the rudder is being turned. The bit is being pulled. And he can direct the whole life by learning, by teaching us to let our tongue be his. The gifts of the Spirit are many. There are nine of them. A good many of those are vocal gifts. And here's something I want to tell you. I believe with all of my heart. I've practiced it for all the years I've been spirit filled, which is 40 I practice it every day, multiple times a day, long periods of the day, under my breath or vocally. I don't do it where I look like I'm a crazy man, but I do do it. I speak in tongues. There are so many things that happen when people speak in tongues. I, I, it's, it's not scary. It's functioning in the, walking in the Holy Spirit. I don't know about you, but I don't know how to pray without ceasing because I can't think of enough things to pray for. Can I? Am I just crazy or is that kind of the way you are too? I have a hard time thinking of that many things to pray for. And most of the things I pray for have to do with stuff I want. And I might want you to be healed. I might want this or I might want that. But I spend my time asking God for stuff I want. And I'm not even sure it is what he wants. And the Bible tells us that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if he hears us, we have the thing we've desired of him. And that kind of tells me that all that stuff I pray for that never happens, God wasn't listening or maybe it's timing or whatever, but you get my point. That is a very specific scripture. Ask anything according to his will. He hears you, and if he hears you, you got it. That would change our lives. But it would also change the direction and the demeanor of our character. It would also get me used to listening to the Holy Spirit because... His sheep hear his voice. He's speaking. I may just not be picking up the phone. Pastor Josh is really quiet now. He's really quiet now. Philippians 2, 12, and 13, and I close. It's my first closing. <laughs> no, it's, it's my last closing. Eight minutes and 39 seconds worth. Verse 13. 
These are like life verses for me. It says, therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. It doesn't say work for your salvation, but work on it. You know, there's a lot to work on. There's a lot to grow into. There's a lot to experience. Work on it with fear and trembling. The fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. Scripture tells us that. The fear of God is is clean. The fear of God is knowing that he has the power to vaporize me in a second. He has the power to say, depart from me, I never knew you. But he also has the power to do miraculous things. He has the power to save me from myself. He has the power to save me from danger, heal my body, to do all kinds of things. And he says, work on it with that, with that sense, that, that perspective of who God is. But there's more than that. And he goes on to say, for it is God who is at work in you to will and to do of his good pleasure. Wow. Understand this. The words there are powerful. It's God who works in you to want to. That's exactly what it means. To be excited to do of his good pleasure. But it's one thing just to be excited about doing God's pleasure, but no way to get there. He works in you not only to cause you to want to, but then he's also working to give you the want to to do what he wants you to do and the, and the ability to do it. He works to will, to want to, and to be able to. Wouldn't it be frustrating if God gave you the desire to want to, but you couldn't ever get there? He wouldn't set you up for failure like that. He says, I'm going to work in you so that you want to do what I want you to do, and you're going to be able to do it. It's going to be a joy to you. It's going to be a strength to you. It's my strength to get my work done when my will is approached. So why it's so hard to serve God? Maybe you're serving your definition of God. Walk in the Spirit. Listen to His voice. Watch the thing. When you pray, God, not my will, but yours be done. That's the thing. Why don't you stand with me as we close? Here's the thing, guys. That prayer of, Lord, not my will, but yours be done, opens the door to Him. That's Peter standing with arms wide open, say, Lord, whatever. I have my preferences, but my my new preference is that I would do what you want. I've sensed all morning long that that was the cry. I think Pastor Josh was mentioning it earlier. I feel that's a cry this morning from the heart of God that he would ask us today, would you let me be Lord? He already is, but you get to vote. You get to vote in that which concerns you. Are you ready to do what Peter was told to do and stretch out your hands and let another lead you? Hmm? I highly recommend it. He's got better ideas than you do. And not only that, he's going to give you a love for it and a capability to to do it, to understand it and to walk it out. But it's your job to let him do it. He's given you a sovereign will. He will not override your will. If you think your ideas are better than his, he'll say, go ahead. Reap what you sow. But I'd a whole lot rather reap what he sows. So how many of you would raise your hands today and say, you know, Pastor, I'm going to take that challenge. I'm going to take that challenge right now. I'm going, to, I'm going to say, Lord, I trust you enough that I want you 
to lead me. I'm going to lay, I'm going to lay my will on the altar today and see if it's consumed or resumed. I'm going to see if I'm on the same page with you. But Lord, I'm just asking you today, come on, get him up if you're, if you're there. Boy, that makes the heart of God so happy. Things are being released to people in this room right now. Ideas and dreams, feelings, senses, answers to prayer that you've been praying are being released because you said, God, I'm putting it all on the altar right now. Maybe for the first time. Maybe this is the first time in your life you've ever said yes to Jesus. And if it is, please come see us. Please come see us in a few minutes. The Father, right now, in the name of Jesus, you look upon the heart. We can say it with our mouth, but you're looking at the heart. And I believe in this room today, there are person after person after person that are making the declaration that all of hell hates to hear. In the name of Jesus right now, Lord, I pray you'll open the eyes of our understanding and show us what is the hope of your calling. Make our election sure. God, let this be that day we mark on the calendar. Said every day after that day was different because. God, I pray in the name of Jesus that you will open our spiritual ears to hear what the Spirit is saying to the churches. And we're that person. We're part of that group. Lord, would you give people courage to act on things you confirm? Would you open our spiritual ears because we're listening for your voice, not seeing an echo from ours? I bless these folks today. I thank you for each one of them. Do exceedingly, abundantly, above and beyond everything they can even ask or think. Because that's the kind of God you are. I praise you for that. And we give you thanks in Jesus' name today. Amen. Amen. And amen. God bless you. If you received Jesus for the first time today, would you meet us right down here at the front? God bless. Have a wonderful week. Amen.